bringing this five-week series to the Panorama and to New York City. Uh, to give you a quick introduction to what we've done and the logic behind our madness here, uh, we have been looking at the legacy of urban renewal in New York City. Uh, that legacy, from our perspective, actually starts with the baby thought. Um, we're an organization that helps people get access to vacant public land to create new pocket parks and gardens in their own neighborhood, to work with people wherever they live, before they leave a business to a hole that needs to be filled in. We help 30 groups start new space-based projects that are community-managed, and we started really seeing a pattern in the vacant lots in our neighborhoods and recognizing there had to be something to this pattern. If you look carefully at the panorama, there are three little green indicators, and I'm not going to tell you where they are. You can look for them. Those green indicators are community gardens and community farms today. They were also planned open spaces that were planned as open space in the urban renewal plans for the neighborhoods where they're situated. Without our help and without the organizing of neighbors who live next door on, around the corner and on the block, those three spots would still be just vacant lots behind fences. So we started wondering, what's, what, what is this plan open space? What does it mean? And who's doing the planning? And who's making these goals and leaving them? in our neighborhoods. And we started working backwards and we realized that there was a real um, presence of urban renewal in our neighborhoods today. So we, we actually got access to all of the housing conservation and development records. Since the passage of Title I of the Housing Rights Act in 1949, housing preservation and development and it's uh, under its very uh, under its various name has been the agency in charge of urban renewal. We realized that not only is New York City still using urban renewal to declare neighborhoods blighted and clear whole communities, uh, but it, it's something that New York City decided to keep doing long after 1974 when the federal government declared this project a failure nationwide. So what we've done here today is put indicators on the panorama for each of the urban renewal plans that the city's ever adopted. The red ones are plans that are active today. The yellow ones are ones that have expired. And if you have a couple of minutes at some time this afternoon, the best way to actually understand the narrative of this history is to start at the top of the ramp, where we started in 1949, and work your way down where we saw the timeline along the top of the walls. Uh, so, uh, this is our third week of programming. Uh, we went to Willis Point a couple of weeks ago and actually saw what the present day urban renewal area looks like. If you want to read about that and see pictures, look for us to refer to this great coverage of our journey through an area that has been called blighted for 20 years and has actually been not provided any municipal services for all that time. Uh, last week, we also showed the Pruitt Avenue, which about the legacy of public housing and how it was supported and then neglected. That's actually available on Netflix if you want to catch up with us. Uh, last week we had a great discussion about the Mitchell Obama program, which was recorded. And you can find it on SoundCloud. Just look for financialacres.org. And we saw a clip of It Took 50 Years, Francis Goldman and Al Cooper Square, which is a documentary in the making. It tells an amazing story of a community that fought for over half a century to actually create the first community land trust in Manhattan. So that's where we've been. Today we go through the preamble with Samuel Zip, who's going to take us into the Manhattan Project that actually paved the way for the urban renewal that we've documented here today. So I'm going to turn it over to in just a moment. But after this program, we invite you up into the second floor theater. Um, to see archival footage of the West Side in the 1960s and 70s and the Latino community actually resisted the clearance of their neighborhoods and worked to take those back and to re-occupy the ways that the city had actually removed residents from.
So that program is called the Corleone Center, and it'll be the in the late 1940s into the early 1950s. It's based off the work that I did for my book, Manhattan Projects, The Rise and Fall of the Renewal and Cold War New York. Um, so I'm mostly going to be talking about things that are happening down here on the Manhattan uh, uh, part of the, the panorama. So if uh, folks want to get a better view, probably over there or here, probably the best place to see. And the events that I'm talking about mostly circle around the early uh, years of urban renewal, so the things that are cataloged at the top of the ramp. Uh, so if later on you get a chance, you want to check it out, that's the, in some ways the history that I'll be talking about. Okay, so I'm, I'm a historian. Uh, when I came to write a book about urban renewal, I found that I was interested in uh, sort of two ways of thinking about these kinds of interventions in city life. I was interested in the ways that the cities have been shaped physically, in the physical intervention, the transformations in city spaces, but also the ways that these interventions were imagined, the ways that they were underpinned by particular conceptions of city life, conceptions of how cities should be lived in and understood. I've always been interested in the intellectual and symbolic dimensions of city life, the deeper visions and conflicts that spur urban history. So in some ways, this is what drew me to a topic like urban renewal, because it seemed like there might be some opportunity for uh, new thinking about it, to put fresh light on a topic that we think we know and understand. So we can think of urban renewal as a policy. As, um, and when I talk about urban renewal in my book, I mostly mean a very specific thing, the campaigns to remake cities that were authorized and funded by the United States Housing Act of 1949. Uh, we can trace that history as a story of political decisions and urban policies. However, uh, renewal was essentially an attempt to solve fiscal and economic problems in the aftermath of World War II. And looking at it this way, urban renewal was essentially an attempt to head off suburbanization and attract capital back to central cities by giving the federal government the fiscal wherewithal to attract private developers who wanted to undertake redevelopment projects in cities. And many of us are familiar, of course, with the results of those policies. We sort of have a, a, a historical uh, uh, verdict that's been rendered on it. Part of that's uh, part of the process of bringing up an exhibit like this to the Queen's Museum today. Right? We have a sense that urban renewal was one of the policy in which the old 19th century city was bulldozed to clear away uh, things that uh, parts of the city that people thought of as quote slums or blight and replace it with a new modern cityscape influenced by what was then state-of-the-art um, modern architectural and urban planning theory, right? Super block plans, dog dustier modern buildings, the so-called towers in the park ideal, right? We're going to be talking about a number of those places today. My book deals with those sorts of details, many of which are, of course, fascinating and important, but I'm also interested, I think, in a larger kind of sense of, of the vision underpinning all of this. Um, in many ways, urban renewal was much more than just policy. It was a kind of vision of how cities could be rescued, a vision that sparked a series of conflicts and struggles over how Americans should live in cities and what it meant to live in cities. These were political conflicts, right? They involved social movements, they involved policy, they involved protests, they involved um, all sorts of uh, wrangling in the political arena. But in, a, in some sense, they were also fundamentally struggles over the meaning of city life as well. A great deal of the source of these struggles over meaning resulted from conflict over what the impact of this policy, um, what the impact of modern planning and architecture truly was going to be. Across the course of the 1950s in New York City, as I argue, people asked themselves whether these massive transformations were really fulfilling their promise. Were they truly developing? Were they truly progress? Or did they end up more as destruction, more as markers of loss? So supporters of urban renewal had very idealistic goals when the program first got started, um, coming out of the 1930s into the late 40s. Um, they hoped to make urban property profitable on the one hand and bring uh, the white middle class back, back downtown in the era when folks were leaving for the suburbs. But they also wanted to try to rehouse people living in what they thought of as slums to rationalize and order a chaotic, unplanned city. And particularly in Manhattan, they wanted to supply the city with a modern built environment equal to what they saw as New York's role as capital of the world in the post-war era. Manhattan's urban renewal boosters hoped that urban renewal would help project an image of modernization and prosperity that would compete 
with and hopefully even surpass the equally grandiose visions of, of progress that were on offer in the Soviet Union, and that's the, the Cold War subtext in my title. Opponents, on the other hand, those people who were forced to live with the impact of these projects, saw urban renewal as a symbol of far less promising and grand developments. For them, it literally meant the destruction and loss of numerous working class neighborhoods, perpetuating de the deindustrialization that was eroding working class livelihoods, and it also fostered increased racial segregation. But urban renewal's opponents also saw the effects of its plans as an absolutist and overwhelming imposition on older patterns of city life. What was modern and clean and regimented um, and rational for urban renewal's backers was alienating and uh, kind of dystopian landscape for many of the people who ended up opposing it. Many of them thought it had a social and aesthetic impact more suited to a totalitarian regime rather than the United States. They too saw these projects in light of images and ideas motivated by the Cold War struggle with the Soviet Union. So Manhattan Projects as a book is concerned with the way the urban renewal formed as a vision of remaking cities, how it was put into practice in actual places in the Manhattan cityscape, and then how it was undone in the wake of the uh, counter visions that arose from those people who lived in these places and the things they tried to do to, to try to undo the idea of urban renewal. So in many ways, one of the things that I, I tried to do is to move beyond some of the familiar stories we have about it to move beyond the familiar pitting of Robert Moses versus Jane Jacobs that has uh, structured for many years the story of our, our understanding of renewal. Um, to do this, I looked at four case studies where uh, I think were pivotal points in the history of rising up and, and codifying renewal in the 40s and 50s, and places where it wasn't so simple to just think of this as a kind of uh, a battle between these two great figures. In fact, uh, most of the history that I tell predates the, arrive, the, the arrival of uh, Jane Jacobs is a, is a sort of player in the scene of urban renewal and modernist planning and leads up to her. And I also look to place Robert Moses in the context of many other actors who were looking to shape the cityscape. So while we are sitting, standing in front of one of Moses' great creations, the New York Panorama, we want to think about him as only one actor in a larger set of um, competing and cooperating actors. Okay, so I, I look at um, some of these four case studies. Some of these places aren't, uh, aren't, haven't been called out so much explicitly on the map here of uh, the renewal areas that we're highlighting today. Uh, because I've been most concerned, as I said, to show the vision underpinning the renewal and the way that it was contested. And these linked developments got underway even before urban renewal had been codified in the 1949 Housing Act. So for me, one of the most important places to begin is actually a place that we don't often think in terms of these, uh, of these kinds of urban renewal innovations, but was actually a place that I see as very crucial to the beginnings of this kind of modernist um, uh, planning intervention in the cityscape. And that is the, the um, UN headquarters over on East River. We're all familiar, I think you can see it there. Um, the UN headquarters was a one of the first uh, of the one of the first of the uh, major uh, urban planning projects that was planned for the um, for for Manhattan after World War II, and it was um, I think we often think of it as the arrival uh, on 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 American shores of the kind of modernist skyscraper, the glass skin office building, and it was that in a way, but it was also in many ways the arrival of a new form of modernist urban planning and the codification of it as a, a way to save the, the city. Now there have been plans going back into the 1930s to do this sort of thing, particularly in public housing, and we'll see a little bit about that in a minute, but the, the United Nations building arrives with a real and uh, important kind of powerful symbolism on American shores in the years after World War II. Um, it's the model for this new model, this new mode of urban planning. You can see, of course, here in these famous uh, images, a little dull here, uh, by uh, Ezra Stoller, uh, how, uh, how powerful an impact it had an intervention on the landscape of the city. Um, this uh, was built for several acres of, um, of slaughterhouses and industrial plants um, and along Turtle, what was called Turtle Bay there on this river. Um, it was planned to entirely replace that wall that we saw here that now has been swept away for um, was swept away for the for the United Nations. Um, this magazine article here that you see on this slide is one that uh, was in a magazine called UN World 
um, and it described the undesirable uses, the slaughterhouse um, uses that were there in, in the neighborhood before the UN arrived. It talks here about this little, this, this uh, unfortunate goat there, uh, whose name was Judas, who led all the sheep to slaughter at the slaughterhouses. And this was the kind of world that was still existing in the 1940s in, uh, in Manhattan, and was being going to be ushered away by the UN. Um, here's a, a brochure that was used to uh, to advertise the idea of the United Nations making a significant and clearing impact on the cityscape of the city. You can see here it is snapping right into place there um, to implant a whole new spatial model onto the cityscape of, of New York. Uh, again, another of the Ezra Stoller pieces showing the, the open space that would be cleared from the, the surrounding city and the clean, austere lines of its uh, European-derived modernist architecture to interject a whole new way of seeing sort of new, new model of avant-garde urbanism for the city. And this gives you a sense uh, of the way that they, the folks who planned the United Nations imagined that it would transform the whole city, that its energies, you can see in this image of the United Nations, to the right, in the center, sort of center right image. And then this was a plan uh, approach to the United Nations along 47th Street that would, that would uh, sort of it's the energies of the United Nations we would be harnessed to creep out into the rest of the city and to remake it according to this, uh, these kinds of goals. And this was a, a vision of, of linked goals, right? A sense that the, the United Nations brought, um, brought peace to the world and it would also bring a transformed environment to the United States. So this linked urban and global goal that the United Nations symbolized was important for getting uh, this whole vision of urban and global going, giving it this sort of uh, huge goals that would, would give it the prestige to win over hearts and minds to imagine that this was an important thing that needed to be done in the city, or rather um, sometimes dour architecture. But it had this kind of um, urbanistic appeal to, a, uh, to the, to the tr American tradition of the green swar and the, 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 the park in the center of the city. Um, so I'm hoping to soften some of the uh, European modernist influences to make it a, a kind of new American idiom for transforming cities and for uh, establishing a new kind of, or a new vision of what middle class life in the city could be. Size of the town was, was immensely controversial, however, and this image, which was made by a, an organization called the Citizens Housing Council, points out some of the problems that people had with Size of the Town as it was planned and as it was being built. The sense that it was um, far too dense, uh, that you felt like uh, you were caught on the outside looking into it. It, it, it blocked views that it um, seemed to be there seemed to be hard to get in and out of it. Now some of these play, some of these um, some of these objections to Stuyvesant and Town were I think a bit overwrought at the time. And in many ways Stuyvesant and Town has, has mellowed over time and become a place that's far more integrated in the cityscape. But one of the most important things that marked early Stuyvesant and Town life was the fact that it was racially segregated. And MetLife, like many private landowners of the day, claimed the right to to restrict their uh, their leasing to um, whoever they wanted to. And so a large, a long battle was set off in Stuyvesant Town between the, the nascent civil rights movement in the city during those years, including some Stuyvesant Town residents, who campaigned up into the 1950s to desegregate Stuyvesant Town. And they were officially uh, successful in the early 1950s, convincing that life that they should drop their restrictions to African Americans moving into the, to the development. Um, so it was one of the first battles, and you know, a whole host of battles around uh, access to the cityscape that, that will mark the whole history of urban renewal as it, um, as it is wheeled out and uh, rolled out across the, the cityscape and places are, uh, and inequality is, becomes more and more of a problem as we look at the attempts to transform the city. Um, this is a, an image, you know, it isn't, isn't very bright, but it's an image from a flyer that the residence committee, people in Stout, who lived inside Stout's Town were organizing to segregate the period, showing them imposed on the plaza, um, hoping to, uh, to fight their own or their segregation. Um, Stout's Town was fascinating in many ways because it was a place that um, was heavily advertised and was very well known in the late 1940s. It was sort of, it's hard to imagine now how consequential it seemed as a place that uh, transformed, was, was set to transform the city. And it was advertised in magazines and newspapers. Um, and people uh, went to uh, department stores like Ludwig Bauman, one of the old department stores in the city, um, to find uh, uh, sort of model designs for Stuyvesant Town apartments. Uh, so consequential was it going to 
be that it was this sort of uh, imagine as part of the post-war consumer marketplace, the great post-war boom, that a place like Stocks and Town. And in this case, um, it's a little hard to see, but each of those names in the black blocks on the left of this ad are public housing projects as well. And so for a, a brief moment in the late 1940s, uh, people thought of these middle income developments and public housing in the same, uh, in the same context, these places that were transforming the city and that were going to make city life better. It's featured there right alongside Housing. Here's another of these ads showing how uh, a young housewife might go redecorate her apartment with a kind of very um, gendered notion of, of, of women taking care of their home. And Sides of Town was supposed to feature in the landscape, as you can see, this the, the uh, layout of a typical apartment there, uh, descending into the landscape of the city as a way for, for middle class people to secure their, their values in, in the cityscape. It was featured even in as, as big a magazine here as House and Garden showing how the Stives of the Town uh, apartment fits into the larger landscape and how people learned and worked on domesticating and making their, um, making their apartments um, more, uh, more open to, to people's uh, attempts to try to make them flexible, to make them less uh, regimented, which is something that many people worried about the Stives of the Town. I also am interested in uh, the third of my business is, is public housing in East Harlem. I was interested in a whole group of public housing developments that grew up, that developed, and that were built between the late 1940s and the uh, late 1960s in East Harlem, right? And you can see just by looking at the panorama how this entire area has been entirely been re was redeveloped in the late 1940s. East Harlem was one of the neighborhoods that was the most consequentially um, intervened upon, I might say, by, by see how many of those modern towers there are and open spaces there are there um, that intervene. You know, it's really comparable to the Lower East Side, right, where there's massive swaths of public housing along the East River, or to out in um, Brownsville and East New York, or out in Oakland, where there are also large concentrations of public housing. Um, so East Harlem is one of the, the greatest, of, one of the places where public housing was first imagined as, as a place to come in. Uh, and this is a map here that's uh, showing some of the earliest uh, places that were redeveloped, um, that were being planned for redevelopment in the East Harlem City State. You can see there, um, it's a map that where north is to the right, so you can imagine a line there on top of the city, on top of the panorama. Um, and some of those very places are there that are on the map, are there, are on the, uh, on the panorama now, realized in space. This is a view from 106th and Park, so right about in there, East, out across over Franklin Plaza to the left, and um, the uh, Washington houses to the right. The Washington houses are those ones that have sort of pinker hue to them, right in there. Yeah, right there. That's the Washington houses, uh, one of the most advanced and most modern of the developments that were made for East Harlem in these years. Um, you can see how how many of these places were, and how how impressive their intervention in the landscape is from this photo. You can compare it there to the panorama. Um, this is the interior of um, James Weldon Johnson houses, which are just a little bit to the north of the Washington houses, right up in there. Um, we've seen some of the, the attempts to, to, to make uh, interior design for these places, too. Um, this is the Washington houses itself. Again, the, the pinkish ones there. Um, some of the most modern, the most derived from European influences, Corbusier, and so on and so forth, of all the public housing designs. In, Uh, this is uh, what happened, it was very interesting about what happened in Manhattan, in, in East Harlem, was an attempt by a group of people who were working in the neighborhood, um, social workers, who were uh, really concerned with the impact that urban renewal was having. Uh, and they began to see that urban renewal was planting a new kind of cityscape that felt alienating to them and transforming to them, and they started coming up with ways to redesign the space of public housing. So this was a redesign that they submitted to um, the city to try to get the Clinton houses totally transformed and made into a new kind of space with lower houses, more, more friendly open space, more spaces that were connected to the streets around them. This design failed and was never built, and the Clinton houses went ahead as a series of, of, of regular towers. It's really hard to see that they're sort of right in there. And, um, and so this wasn't built, but it, was, it kicked off a number of things that they tried to do to try to rethink the cityscape of urban. This is the building Clinton houses as they were actually built. 
Um, and they uh, got together with a number of people, including Jane Jacobs, uh, the, the writer who was just uh, on the cusp of publishing Death and Life of Great American Cities, her classic attack on modernist urban renewal and city building. And she got involved in the late 1950s as she was getting ready to write the book with all this group of social workers. And they hired um, landscape architects and people who were also beginning to question modernist orthodoxy to try to create new kinds of spaces. This flyer from Arts Crafts and Photography Show shows, uh, shows a redesigned open space in the James Bond Johnson houses, which are also up there in Swap. Right there. And um, they tried to redesign spaces that would be more community friendly, more open to the streets around them, less, um, less cut off from the streets. This is the Franklin Plaza houses where the landscape designer um, by the name of um, uh, Albert Meyer uh, went in and, and changed around all the open space uh, designs and tried to make these a series of, of more intimate kinds of spaces that would try to humanize the, 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 the inhuman spaces of uh, this is some of his designs so looking out from the windows of one of the towers over the, the newly redesigned spaces that would hopefully knit the place back into the, the, the city or um, And this is their map. It's a map of the social workers who were involved in a, a place called the, um, the East Harlem Project, uh, put together to try to advertise to people across the city that it might be worth coming to try to live in, in a place like East Harlem. They turned the Franklin Plaza into a co-op and they hope to attract people to live there. So Franklin Plaza is um, here on the map, and it's here on the panorama. And this was a place that they hoped to advertise as a place that would, would, would attract middle class residents back to the city. Um, and they tried to highlight it here amongst all these other developments that were going on. And as you can see, they tried to rename in a somewhat paternalistic way the upper uh, the East Rome, the new upper east side, right? With the Franklin Plaza cooperative as at the heart of it. Franklin Plaza is still there today, a co-op uh, building there on, um, in East Harlem. And as you can see, uh, on the panorama, it's still surrounded by uh, lots of public housing. That neighborhood has been, uh, has been one of the most consequentially affected. Um, and finally, the, the other place that I write about, and we're going to hear more about today in the, in the films that we're going to be seeing a little bit later, is the Lincoln Square Urban Renewal Area and its centerpiece, Lincoln Square, for the point about performing arts. And I'm going to linger a little bit on Lincoln Square and talk about that area. Um, talk about the, the redevelopment of that area to, um, to really point out the, the impact of urban renewal at its height. Um, in some ways, Lincoln Square was the quintessential Manhattan project, the most exalted and representative urban renewal site in the program's early history. It was to be this sort of project of great international significance, the fulfillment of the campaign of urban rebirth and international visibility that had been launched at the United Nations um, uh, a decade earlier when it arrived on Turtle Bay. So we hope to use the power of high culture, right, the performing arts, to rescue the city and confirm New York's status as the sort of so-called capital of the world, right, the cultural capital of the world in this case. Uh, the film West Side Story in the early 1960s, because uh, some of the scenes for the film West Side Story were actually filmed in the neighborhood around Lincoln Center, in the demolished areas around Lincoln Center, um, where they were preparing the urban renewal plans. Um, and so, uh, the urban renewal site at, at the Center takes on some of the kind of power and interest of the kind of post-war culture of the, of, the, uh, of the city, signified here by, of course, the, uh, Riff, the, the leader of the Jets, leaping above the burning conflagration of the, of the city below him and the great modern tower um, shooting up to show the, the new coming up from behind. Um, we also have some images here. Oh, this one's way too but this is the uh, this is, these are the modern architects who planned Lincoln Center. Some of the famous names in modern architecture: um, Harrison, Abramovitz, uh, Hero Saarinen, um, along with, with Rockefeller, uh, uh, David, uh, excuse me, John D. Rockefeller, who the third, who was the, the major uh, nonprofit mover behind the building of Lincoln Center. Here they are posed in some of the models. And then here we have um, some of the figures, great figures from New York's mid-century performing arts, posed with a model in front of the neighborhood, uh, in one of the vacant lots where the where uh, Lincoln Center was going to be built, in front of some of the other buildings that were soon to go before the wrecking ball. So this was a very all these images were part of a publicity campaign that was um, that was uh, an attempt to try to try to situate Lincoln Center as at the heart of uh, of the uh, coming rebirth of, of Manhattan in the post-war era. 
Um, by the mid-50s, when the project got underway, this triumphant endeavor also required a more sort of strategic mission as well. And Lincoln Center was called on to provide what we might think of as a symbol of national uh, cultural maturity and urban resurgence that could be brandished in the Cold War with the Soviet Union. That could be shown that the, the United States was taking care of its internal divisions and its internal problems, so it would be strong enough to stand up to this threat from the outside that we were all being told we had to gird for and to, to be, care, to be uh, ready for uh, in the coming years of the post-war era as the Cold War started to collect and, 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 and freeze, so to speak. So you have, you have Eisenhower here um, making uh, a day, his, his uh, speech at the debut at the groundbreaking of, of, of Lincoln Center. There he is, it's sort of hard to tell from this image, but what's happening here is he's standing on the dais and he's got a, a huge rendering of some of the very early plans for Lincoln Center that were later modified quite considerably as they were. been to Lincoln Center Hotel. Um, he's there on the dais, he's got Mayor Wagner to his right, um, he's got John D. Rockefeller to his left. Um, Sorry, to our right, Mayor Wagner, Rockefeller to our left. And um, in the background are some other figures. Moses, Robert Moses is hovering in the background there too. Um, sort of symbolically for me, I think important to understand how he was only one person in a larger uh, team of people doing things like this. So in a time when both urban renewal and the performing arts were envisioned as resources for shoring up the nation's sort of internal cultural defenses, Lincoln Center brought both of these missions together. It, should, it became this kind of a cultural and urban mission dovetailing with one another in one kind of literally shining symbol and giving it sort of concrete form in the cityscape. The complex's sponsors, particularly Rockefeller, hope they will prove that Americans living in what people thought of in that as the affluent society valued spiritual as much as material goods. They worried that in an affluent society, we would lose track of the more important virtues that we would become kind of a, a sort of fat and happy society that only uh, wanted um, plenty and not uh, those things that were uh, more valuable. And so the Lincoln Center was the kind of place that could, that could anchor these sorts of, uh, these older values in the cityscape. So it, in many ways, this symbolizes these linked missions, urban resurgence, kind of cultural resurgence, and this Cold War mission by providing Lincoln Center with a setting on par with, great, with classical European models of urban planning. So, and so again, another one of the early plans for Lincoln Center, one of the early variations. You have a sense of how it was planned as uh, an American update of a Venetian piazza, and a way that offered what Rockefeller called at one, point, at one point a new kind of city therapy that made culture and the arts the cornerstone of modernist superblock and open space urban renewal efforts. But of course, with that vision came a rather less exalted um, understanding or perspective on the people who lived in the neighborhood around Lincoln Center. In the city's plans, the people of the neighborhood were sort of afterthoughts, incidental to the visual and statistical impression of decay and decline on display in the promotional materials like this one that Robert Moses and his uh, slum clearance officials prepared to try to rationalize and to try to promote the uh, knocking down of the neighborhood. Um, there was physical deterioration in this neighborhood, for sure, in this little section of the, of the Upper West Side called Lincoln Square. Most of the rug houses there dated from the 19th century. Many were run down. Residents had long found it hard to get loans for improvements. Um, but the truth about the neighborhood, and this is a streetscape, 64th Street, I think, all long gone now, completed, uh, destroyed for, for Lincoln Center. Um, the truth about the neighborhood itself, its people, its institutions, the way people made lives there, was considerably more complicated than it led on by those kinds of very clean, austere brochures or their sensory fonts and their kind of modern uh, sense that, that, that new planning could sweep away the whole cityscape with little trouble. Now, the project sponsors who worked to, to transform this, the, the, uh, to, to transform this area and to, and to figure out what to do about the people who live there to try hard to treat um, the residents and business people that live there fairly. I don't think they dealt with them unfairly. But they did regard them as largely impediments in the way of, some way of, of a greater future. And encouraged them in the ways that they discussed the project to see uh, the residents there, to see themselves as playing a role in the arrival of a brave new world. They, they would be said to play a small part in the great drama of civic splendor, national triumph, and urban rejuvenation. So rather than um, always entirely seeing them for what they were, 
um, which I think is as actors on their own terms in a neighborhood drama of their own making, they kind of uh, wanted them to see themselves as part of some larger drama that would, would uh, ennoble everyone across the nation. And I think some people agreed with that sense of it, but others weren't so sure. Um, not all the residents saw it that. This was a polyglot urban neighborhood, typical for Manhattan of that era. Working in lower middle class, the residents were largely native-born Americans um, of immigrant descent who traced their origins to a huge diversity of European countries. Um, the largest and fastest growing minority in the neighborhood, as we're going to see in the films uh, in, in a minute here later today, was a uh, Puerto Rican population, who which stood at around a quarter of the total in the early to mid-1950s. In response to the plans, which were announced in 1955, um, a host of neighborhood groups organized, and they uh, solidified into two distinct committees. <clears throat> One made up of residents, the other made up of uh, business people to try and stop the project. And they tried to turn out people, like in this flyer here, um, to go to the city hall, to the um, to a rally, to try to turn back the project, to try to stop it. Um, their testimony before one of their city planning commission uh, hearings around around the center was, was quite telling and reveals their very different understanding of the nature of their neighborhood um, from those on offer, or from those who planned it, who saw it as a kind of culture descending from on high to save the neighborhood. So here they are um, protesting at one point uh, with their idea, with the idea that shelter should come before culture. One of the major themes that emerges from their testimony is the conception of their lives and their homes as a kind of alternative form of culture, one that Lincoln Center's vision didn't really understand and also imperiled. As one resident put it during this hearing, what about our homes? Aren't our homes beauty and culture too? But it wasn't, also, it wasn't just um, private life that was imperiled. There was a public dimension as well. At Lincoln Center, public and private were yoked together by the commercial life of the community. And so what I'm going to do here to sum up is to zoom in a little bit on some of what was going on in Lincoln Square around 1955, just before this uh, project got underway. Um, so here's what Lincoln Square looked like in plan before the urban renewal project went through. And there's the neighborhood itself. You can see the footprint of it, the footprint of those few blocks right there that are now taken up by the center of the panorama. Right there, bending around there. You can see there, that's the footprint looking down from above. Um, one of the fascinating things that I, uh, that I wanted to get at and to show in my book is how diverse and, and, and dense the, the commercial landscape of this neighborhood was. How many businesses there of all different types. Um, I was able to, uh, to find some uh, to find some records of all the businesses were there, and there were actually about 600 places of business there. A staggering variety of this. Of course, it's unusual even for Manhattan today, where chain and big box stores, as we all know, have begun to move in, and where most industry has been banished either to the boroughs or to other parts of the country or the world. But in the late 1950s, Lincoln Square was a thriving mixed-use neighborhood, a roll call of the various establishments would give you um, a sense of, uh, of an idea of this. And I'm not going to go through them all. You can see a little all of them in my book. But we'll get some sense of the, the types of businesses, right? So I made this word cloud of all the different things, right? All the different kinds of businesses that were there. So you have all sorts of things. Uh, typewriter repair, dental laboratory, motion picture warehouse, the many groceries, those machine shops, detective agencies, cigar stores. You can just see all the different sorts of things. And then just to be a little more Fun. I weighted them according to their, their prominence in the, in the landscape. So you have, of course, many clothing stores, many groceries, um, many different corners, laundries, restaurants, tailors, barnacles, the sort of things that are larger in this work cloud are those that are, that are that were more prominent and had more, more representations. Um, um, so if we think about what was in that particular city square, we can um, zoom in even further to look at one particular block, and I think that's a useful thing to do, just to get a sense of how it is. So we'll look at this, this area here, the, the place where Lincoln Center would arrive, um, and then we'll zoom in even further and look at the one block right in the middle there, between 63rd and 64th, between Columbus and Amsterdam. Um, and here's a uh, distribution, uh, so perhaps zooming in a little bit more, there we are. Here's a distribution of all the different kinds of, of businesses on that block. Here's where they all are, the red dots there on the cityscape. Um, and then we'll categorize all these different businesses just in this area according to a set of categories. 
Um, you can see that the biggest uh, percentage was services, there was retail, there was manufacturing, there was recreation and stuff and social, there was uh, all kinds of different businesses in different array, and that pie graph gives you a sense of how they were um, distributed. Um, and then we sorted them according to color in the landscape here, and you can get a sense for how close-knit and interacting they are. This gives you a sense of what exactly things work. So up in the top right, um, you know, so when we have that uh, transformation, uh, we have a, a kind of whole loss of a, a kind of urban, urban infrastructure, urban ecology, we might call it. And actually the residents and the business people who live there had a sense for how to talk about this, this sense of loss, this place that was lost to them. What was lost uh, for them? They had a, a, at least one name for it. And I think it's very well summed up in this image here, which is an image of a guy whose name uh, was Abraham Halleck. He was the owner of an auto parts store who worked in the neighborhood, had his business in the neighborhood, and who went to one of the protests and um, had these two signs up, one of which was kind of funny, uh, suggesting that um, if someone wants to uh, hire him, he needs a job because he's being put out of business, uh, and that they should apply, they should tell the, uh, Robert Moses that they'd like to hire him, because basically Robert Moses at this point owns him, having put him out of business by um, he feeling that he's not able to move his shop out of the area. Um, and then he has this sign right in the middle there that says, pay businessmen for loss of goodwill. Um, what he means by that is that the problem that businessmen like this has, had was that they operated on such slim margins um, that they couldn't really afford to move their businesses. They got paid a certain amount of money um, for moving expenses, but it wasn't ever enough for their capital, for whatever kind of capital they accrued. And so even if they could have found a way to move, they said that there was even one thing that they were losing that went even further than that. And that was what they used the economic term goodwill to describe. Um, they, were said, they, they said, we're invested in the relations of goodwill that they had established between neighbors. And this economic term denotes this sort of intangible asset arising from the, the relationship the business has with its customers. And somewhat, I think this word, this term goodwill arises as a kind of metaphor for the relationship um, between the public and private aspects of, of the neighborhood. The, the thing, the, the very um, resilient but also fragile in this situation when it is so uh, deliberately removed, relationship that, that holds the neighborhood together. So this no notion that the neighborhood embodied a kind of dynamic form of everyday culture based on an economy of goodwill, quite distinct from that one offered in the Lincoln Center plans, um, in many ways underpinned all their efforts to try to save this place. So this vision wasn't immediately successful. It failed to stop urban renewal in Lincoln Square. And I'll leave it up to you to decide what's a more valuable and noble city living, right? There's no doubt that Lincoln Center um, has become part of uh, Manhattan city life, the art of, part of New York city life, and it has established in many ways, in many ways its own form of goodwill with the city at large. Um, but when the movement that arose at Lincoln Square combined with the rethinkings of modernism that were uh, Modernist orthodox, orthodoxy that were unta undertaken by the East Harlem social workers and other people, other people who were beginning to rethink how the city worked, it nonetheless laid the groundwork for a movement to unmake urban renewal, one that would take shape later on in the 1960s and not really fully conclude until the 1970s and 80s, um, but one that would reorient urban planning and city rebuilding away from modern planning ideas into more complex arrangements of, of, of urban renewal with more community. community uh, that we are still living with today and still trying to sort out the, the impact of today. But one of the things my book tried to do is to recover some of these lost stories of early you know, evidence of these almost forgotten struggles and give us a window onto the early days of that history. The history of how urban renewal was made and unmade in Manhattan in 20 years after World War II. It's a story in many ways uh, of, of both triumph, of, of things rising up and um, becoming manifest in the cityscape, but also the tragedy of loss, of building and displacement. It's the story of how the city of towers and ghettos was made, a city that across the last half of the 20th century uh, was simultaneously rising to become a great world city and falling into the urban crisis of the 1960s and 70s. It's the story, in other words, of how New York City was becoming the city we came to know at the end of the 20th century. And in some ways, as this exhibit shows, in our um, ability to see its impact on the landscape and the panorama, it's the city we're still coming to grips with at the beginning of the 21st century. So thanks very much for listening and checking it out.
this area of Queens gets renamed in a vision of mega blocks and big box stores and scenes. Um, when I invite you guys to come sit in a comfortable chair, join us on the second floor, which you can get to by going up to the top of the ramp. We'll be actually looking at some archival footage from before Lincoln Center and before the transformation of the West Side. Third World Newsreel has incredible films that were made at the time uh, by folks who were displaced and then came back and reoccupied city-owned buildings and for a time rebuilt a community that was in the process of becoming the West Side we know today. Uh, Samuel Zip is going to join us and, and Santa Maranova will lead us into the conversation with Jennifer Hawk and Mariana Magdalevich. Uh, we'll take about a five minute break to make your way up and we'll see you there.